Hello everyone. This is Jan Chromi and together we will continue the course Interdisciplinary Approaches to Language and its Use 2. In this presentation we will continue our discussion of Horatianist sociolinguistics. This time we will focus on the concept of style. During the development of Horatianist sociolinguistics, the conception of style has changed significantly. In the first wave, style was treated rather plainly as a degree of attention to speech. Early studies typically differentiated between careful and casual speech, as we saw when we discussed Peter Trudgill's uh, Norwich study. In 1980s, Ellen Bell came with the idea that style should be treated based on the speaker's audience. And later, in the third wave of Variationist sociolinguistics, style came to be a certain central theoretical concept of the whole discipline. Contemporary approaches thus see style as distinctiveness. As we said, in the early phases of Variationist sociolinguistics, style was directly related to the attention to speech. William Leboff talked about the so-called contextual styles. In his famous study on social stratification of English in New York City, he distinguished between the five contextual styles. Casual speech, careful speech, reading of a passage, reading of isolated words, and pronunciation of minimal pairs. This scale is related to the prestige of the variants. Many studies show that the more attention an individual gives to his or her speech, the more prestigious variants he or she uses. Altogether, we can say that this conception of style is rather coarse and also quite outdated. The conception of style as an audience design can be seen as a direct reaction on Lebovian view of style. Alan Bell argued that the crucial role in the way how we speak has the audience of our speech. Bell distinguished between several roles. The most important influence has the person who we directly address, namely the addressee. Based on Bell's analyses, our style is also influenced by two other possible participants. These are the auditors who are part of the interaction but are not directly addressed and the so-called overhearers who are merely passive. They are not part of the interaction, but the speakers are aware about uh, their presence. Bell also mentions uh, the eavesdroppers who, are, who listen to the speaker, but the speaker does not know about them. From the logical point of view, they don't influence the way how the speaker speaks. We already mentioned that during the last 20 years, style become the crucial concept in variation in sociolinguistics. For example, Judith Irvin understands style as a system of distinctions, as a way to differentiate oneself in a certain social space. A related concept is social meaning, which is, so, uh, which is communicated through style. Linguistic differences, such as variants, uh, of a certain variable are linked to certain social meanings. By the use of these variants, we communicate the given social meanings. Importantly, social meanings are not universal and it is quite common that different people ascribe certain variants different social meanings. For example, some people may think of the use of certain variant as a sign of intelligence but others may consider it being elitist or, or even arrogant. Style in this perspective is thus a rather dynamic process where the social meanings may be even negotiated during interactions. Last but not least, we should mention that the style in this approach is not only a linguistic thing, but also relates to behavior in general. Thus, it is not only a way how to how we communicate, but also how do we dress, what hairstyle do we have, and so on. A similar approach to style has been presented by Penelope Eckert in many studies. Eckert discusses also the concept of bricolage. She argues that we have a pool of resources for our self-presentation in the social space. These resources may be linguistic and non-linguistic, and they may be combined together. 
Eckert shows this is uh, in her research on adolescents in a Californian high school in Palo Alto. Women students at this school formed two dominant groups, New Wave and Preppies. Members of New Wave dressed only in black. They wore pants that were narrowed at the ankles and used black makeup. Typical preppies dressed in pastel colors wore straight jeans and so on. In the 2008 study, Eckert discusses two preppy students who describe themselves as being conformist and rather school-oriented, but who also wanted to look more independent than typical preppies. To look more independent, they chose to copy one feature of the new wave, namely the pants narrowed at the ankles. Eckert argues that this is a typical example of what she calls a bricolage. From the range of possible features of being new wave, they chose one specific element and they gave it a social meaning of independence. This element was included into their otherwise preppy style. Before we will conclude this presentation, I have one reading tip for you. It is a study by Devyani Sharma, Style Dominance, Attention, Audience and the Real Me. Sharma discusses further possible changes in the way how to view style in variation in sociolinguistics. She returns toward the attention to speech as an important aspect of style, but she discusses it from the cognitive or rather psycholinguistic point of view. If you enjoyed the presentations, we would be glad if you would like them on YouTube. That is all from me now. See you next time.